Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about comparing the IPCC scenarios for production with industry forecasts. The IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, uses four scenarios as inputs uh, for energy use in their climate models. RCP 2.6 is the low case with low fossil fuel usage. RCP 4.5 has moderate fossil fuel usage. RCP 6 has increasing fossil fuel usage. And RCP 8.5 has out of this world fossil fuel usage. These models were made in the early 2000s. Uh, it's not quite clear if they've been updated. And um, we need to have a look at how they compare with other forecasts for oil use and changes in the energy landscape since these forecasts may have been made. And are these scenarios compatible with uh, known oil reserves and resources? So I'm going to compare them with uh, other several other people. Uh, Shell, uh, Anglo-Dutch oil company, who produce uh, a lot of scenarios. They're in some ways the pioneers of uh, scenario planning. And they produced some scenarios early on this year, sky, waves, and islands. And you have a, can have a good look at uh, Shell's website, which describe how all these uh, scenarios work. The sky scenario, or sky 1.5, is scenario compatible with a 1.5 degree increase in temperatures uh, from pre-industrial levels within climate models. Uh, BP uh, have also produced uh, some uh, scenarios only out to 2050. Business as usual, which used to be called Evolving Transition Network, which looks at basically just things evolve from where they are now slowly. Rapid transition, a concentrated push on trying to reduce fossil fuel use, and net zero, which is what would it take to get to net zero by 2050? Whether that's realistically possible worldwide is another question, but we'll, we can discuss that later. The International Energy Agency, uh, based in Paris, has two main scenarios, stated policies, which effectively is evolving transitional business as usual, and sustainable development, which is more similar to the rapid transition situation. They've also published a pathway to net zero, which is a what would it take to get there scenario, again, looking out to 2050 rather than 2100. And the United States Energy Information Agency, EIA, uh, published the Energy Outlook um, at the tail end of last year, looking out of 2050. So what's all used for? Um, a lot of people think it's just cars and trucks, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, this is a pie chart from BP. 5% of oil is used for electricity generation, mainly on remote islands in the Middle East, and that share has been declining quite steadily and probably would decline to something very low indeed, as it should because the better uses for oil than power generation. Then you've got light vehicles, 20%, heavier vehicles, 24%, so that's trucks and buses, um, then 12% for uh, maritime uh, and aviation, around 7% aviation, around 5% maritime with figures to that effect. Then you have this numbers here, so that's industrial processes, heat, various other industrial processes, etc., and petrochemicals here. Now, what's likely to happen in the future? is the red shirt part, part of the pie chart will increase, the green part of the pie chart will reduce as these things are substituted with new technology, but that process will take time. So data from the IPCC is a little bit hard to come by. Um, this is a paper by uh, Murray in 2016, where he looked at the limitations of all production for the IPCC scenarios, and the original graph was from a uh, paper by Van Vuren in 2011. So what I've done is I've taken the data from here and compared that with other people's forecasts. Looking at IPCC's forecast for 2100, so this was likely to happen in 2100, so that's the numbers of 2000, and these are the numbers further onwards. So you can see the RCP 2.8.5 uses a great deal of coal, a great deal more coal than is used now, uh, and is forecast by anyone else. Uh, in terms of uh, oil usage, RCP 6 is higher, RCP 2.6 RCP is relatively small, so effectively you're confining oil to petrochemicals in this situation. And then again, greater growth within, uh, within renewables, quite high expectations for biofuels, don't quite know if that's going to happen, relatively low uh, for nuclear, still higher than now, but is that going to be enough? We don't know. And this is looking at the evolution from uh, for RCP 8.5. This is taken from a blog called Energy Musings. And you can see the vast amount of coal being used here. I'm sorry, but I don't think that's highly likely. So this is the uh, diagram for energy per source in, uh, in uh, exajoules. So this is adding 2010 and 2019 from the BP Statistical Review of World Energy and comparing it for the long-term RCP uh, scenarios. 
again, uh, growth in renewables, um, uh, various different ones for oil, but coal, can't see that happening, particularly since the coal usage is plateaued and might well actually be started declining already. Is the total energy amount uh, forecasts reasonable? Yes. So what I've done here is the orange line is linear extrapolation from what's been happening in the last 20 years. So I just took the graph here, took the equation, extrapolate onwards. If you take a uh, constant per capita, just look at world population for the United Nations uh, population forecast, you'll end up here. And if you're taking some growth in per capita growth, you'll end up here. So it's within the spread quite where that energy is going to come from and what the sources are is another question. Which was to some extent answered by Shell. So Shell produced Shell Sky, Shell Waves, Shell Islands. And what they see here is vast growth in renewables, wind, solar, perhaps also geothermal. Um, this is something that wasn't quite so uh, done to quite to some extent by the um, uh, people who were doing RCP forecasts quite a while ago. But you can now understand why European oil majors are now getting seriously into renewables because that's where they see potential growth, vast growth in the future. Reasonable thing to want to do. If you look at RC, uh, IPCC forecasts in terms of just oil consumption, so the dark gray line here is history, so that's from the BP World Statistical Review of World Energy, and this is 2.5, 4.5, 6, and 8.5. So you can see 8.5 climbing vastly, then drops off a cliff, basically when you run out of easily accessible reserves, and are having to uh, use a lot of coal in terms of fissure troughs to produce um, liquid fuels. Um, don't think that's going to happen. But RCP6 is effectively steady growth. RCP45 is pretty much constant. And RCP2.6 is decline. Okay, so why is there interesting things? What does that uh, look like with other people? If you're looking at Shell, so this is Shell Sky, Shell Waves, and Shell Islands. Um, you can look at the Shell's website for the assumptions behind that, but you will have a peak in oil consumption either in the late 20s or the mid 30s of this century, and then a steady decline since then, which is why Shell are going into renewables big time, because that's where they see their future. But quite different to the main IPCC models, but not too far away from where 2.5 is. If you're looking at other forecasters, so this is looking at BP, BP's net zero, rapid transition, evolving transition, and IEA's rapid transition and steady as you go stated policies. Okay, fairly compatible with Shell. These are a little bit less than RCP 2.5. We're probably on this sort of trajectory in real life. And EIA, the American uh, government, effectively got steady growth in 2015. None of them forecast beyond 2015. I think they're right because technology will change quite rapidly beyond that. We really don't know. Whereas this time frame, we can have a reasonable go at. But even then, you've got a wide range of forecasts, which you should do because you don't know what's going to happen. Next question you ask is, is there enough oil? So let's just define what oil reserves and oil resources are. Reserves are defined as those quantities of petroleum which are anticipated to be commercially recovered from known accumulations from a given day forward. So this oil we know exists, we know we can get it out. So the hydrocarbons to be classed as reserves need to be able to be accessed with, with current technology, current economic assumptions, i.e. prices and costs, and we need to have all the permissions from the relevant authorities. So, you know, uh, firm project approval from the governments, company shareholders, etc. So this is stuff we have not quite got in the bank, but close to that. Resources are hydrocarbons which exist or may not exist. So uh, the um, hydrocarbon accumulations, they haven't yet met the standards of reserves, but may be upgraded in the future or may not. And uh, prospective resources are figments of a geologist's imagination. So these are things that might happen in the future, but might not. Typically what has happened is resources get discovered, then there's a lot of work to be done to get them to reserve standard once they're uh, to install the production equipment and then we can produce things forward. So how much oil is there in the world? So these are numbers from several different people. So this is BP's statistical review, OPEC's uh, world oil reserves, EIA's proved oil reserves, and a, a Norwegian consultancy called Reistad that publishes uh, two different estimates. 
they publish a estimate of 2p, uh, so that's proved and probable reserves, plus contingent resources, plus possible exploration. And this is Reistad's 2p reser reserves. You can see that the rest of them all vary between 1500 and 1800. The most conservative estimate is about 1245. Reistad's uh, report's actually worth reading, so if you can get on their website and have a look at that, and this descri describes what they feel are the reserves and resources per country and compare them to BP Statistical Review World Energy. So, have we got enough to meet IPCC numbers? In a word, the higher case is no. So these are the reserves that I've showed on the previous graph. BP, OPEC, EIA, Reistad, and Reistad's conservative estimate. So if you look at 2.6 and Shell Sky, no problem. If you look at 4.5, that's just under 2,300 uh, billion barrels. That's significantly more than proven reserves, but you might get there with some exploration, reserves growth. You know, it's possible. Stretchy, but possible. If you're looking at um, RCP6, which is nearly 2.8 trillion barrels, very stretchy. RCP8, no way, basically. That's more than double current reserves estimates. And we've been finding less and less. We're discovering less than 8 billion barrels a year and consuming about 36. RCP8.5 is just not plausible. RCP6 is not plausible. RCP4 is stretched but plausible. So to sum up, many industry forecasters have far lower numbers than IPCC use for their high cases. And there's been quite a lot of talk of peak demand. Whether that's going to happen and quite that's how that's going to happen, I don't know. My gut feel is that you'll probably have plateau demand. As some of the substitutable parts of the oil uh, chain, like cars, get substituted, the non-substitutable parts will grow to make up for it. And eventually we'll burn less oil because oil is too precious to burn when you can turn it to plastics, lubricants, polymers, etc. Another thing that we don't know is new technologies. We don't know what's coming around the corner. We could have nuclear fusion. We could have large scale geothermal. We just don't know. Maybe some advanced biofuel. We don't know. But humanity has been innovative throughout its existence and will continue to be innovative. And we will come up with interesting new solutions. So just to finish off, this chap, Yogi Berra, American baseball great, who also had quite a lot of interesting sayings, which are called yogiisms. And one of them was predictions are difficult, especially about the future. But we have to make predictions and we have to have guesses. We have to have scenarios and they are difficult. Thank you very much.